Good afternoon. So a very warm welcome from the Royal Society of Edinburgh. My name is Professor Sarah Skerritt and I'm Director of Programmes here at the RSE. The RSE is Scotland's National Academy with a mission of knowledge made useful. And today's event is part of the series of Throwback Thursday, which exemplifies that mission that we have. And today I'm delighted that we're joined by Dr. Senga Robertson Alberton, postdoctoral research assistant at the University of Dundee. A warm welcome, Senga, and also winner of the RSE Innovator Prize for Public Engagement in 2019. So, just to give you a brief overview of the format of event of the event, and then I'll, I'll give uh, Senga. I'll give you your proper introduction. Um, we're going to hear Senga's past talk, which will be played, the video, which lasts about nine minutes. Then we'll return again to uh, a live Q&A of 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, do remember that you can submit questions at any time during the playing of the nine minute video using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. And just to note that this event is being recorded and streamed on YouTube. So without further ado, we'll go to the video and we'll see you all again in about nine minutes. So over to the video, thanks. a lot of um, people that really kind of struggle financially in Glenrothes and I was actually one of those families. So the family that I grew up on in was a family with a single parent with employment issues and also with issues with mental health and addiction. And I did pretty well at school. I really enjoyed it. I really loved science. But no one in my family had been to university. I didn't know how I would even go about it. And actually when it came to the age of 16, when things were just going so horribly wrong, I actually ended up living in a teenage homeless place and I left school because I really didn't know what I was doing. And then over time, I got some mentoring from the people at the homeless place and I found a job and I saved up and I rented a little flat and I kept on saving. And actually for years and years and years, I ended up working at a call center for an energy company and there's absolutely nothing wrong with working in a call center. Um, but my job was in complaints. So my job was actually for people to shout at me, which wasn't much fun. After a few years, I became a parent. I was quite young. I had my first child when I was 21. And I had my second child when I was 24. And he was very, very poorly. And he was in a hospital and he had really major heart surgery when he was just tiny and we nearly lost him a few times. And that experience that we had and seeing all of the medics and the nurses and all of the supporting staff made me realize that I wanted to do more with what I was doing. It was great being able to help people working for the energy company because sometimes you have people that are very poor that really need, need help, but I wanted to do more. So I went to a college to find out about an access course. Now, I didn't actually qualify to go on that access course. My grades weren't good enough when I was at school. But I spoke to someone about it, and he listened to me, and he listened to what I was interested in, and he listened to my story. And he gave me a place on that access course. And I did really, really well, because it was something that I really, really wanted to do. I passed the access course. I applied to Dundee University to do life sciences. I initially applied to do biochemistry. And after six months, I realized I was really rubbish at chemistry. So I stopped that bit and stayed with biology. And when I got through to my last year at university, you do something called an honors project. And it's where you can either work in a lab or you do some sort of research and you write like quite a big report on it. And then that's actually what a lot of your grades for at the end of the, the time that you're at uni. And I did mine um, with another member of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, Nicholas Stanley Wall. And we did it all about the microbes that live in your gut, the jobs that they can do to keep you fit and healthy, and what happens when things go wrong with the type of microbes that are in your gut and the balance that's in it. It's called dysbiosis. Um, and the way that I did that wasn't actually in the lab, it was actually in an outreach project. And what I did was I developed a project where you would have a fake gut and you would add all the little different components, little different bacteria that live in your tummy in the 
proportions that you think they should go there based on the jobs that they do, and you get all that information. You add in food, you add in water, and you squidge it all up just like your stomach does, and then you squeeze it out, and it looks like a poo. Yeah, like it really looks like a poo, and I wish that my slide would come up so you could actually see how realistic it looks. It's like a proper poo. Now, if you get the balance wrong, it's an absolute disaster and it's a mess. And that's really good because then you can talk about the people getting involved in the project about dysbiosis and about the importance of looking after the microbes in your gut. Um, and I was really, really lucky because that project was really popular, probably because it was kind of gross. Um, and it was rolled out across lots of schools um, locally to where I was. Um, it's been rolled out nationally and a wee tiny bit internationally as well. Um, I wrote a scientific paper about it, which got published. Um, and I also got an email to say that it had been selected to be run at the White House STEM Open Day, which is kind of cool. But they didn't invite me to actually deliver it, which is a shame, so I didn't get to go over there. But I would like to think that one of the Obamas made one of my poos, which would be quite nice. <laughs> now, um, after, the, after I finished, um, my undergrad, all the way through university, I didn't actually know what I wanted to do. I was kind of really unsure because I, I didn't really know how well I was going to do. I've always been rubbish at exams, like I'll walk into an exam and like my brain will go blank and then I'll walk out and I'll remember what they are. So I never really felt that I was actually going to do that well to get a really, really good job. But actually doing that honours project and because it did so well, I actually did do all right in my last year. And I decided that because of the way that the Honours Project was done, so you've got to research stuff about a specific topic, you've got to work out how you're going to tell everybody about it, you've got to work out how you're actually going to find out the information, and you've got to optimise things as well, for, and you, then you've got to write about it and tell everybody about it. And I realised actually that sounds quite a bit like doing a, a job in scientific research. So I applied for a job to do a PhD, um, which is basically just research for a few years after you do your do your degree and I decided to do it all about the microbes that live around the roots of plants which sounds way different to what happens with the microbes that live in your gut but it's actually not um, it's actually really similar because microbes that live around the roots of plants do really important roles for plants like they help plants get nutrients from soil and they help to pro program the plant's immune system and that's really important because oh, we all kind of like to eat so we need to work that out, especially with the population increasing, especially with issues about sustainability and what's going on with climate change at the moment. So we want to try and find ways that we can help plants to grow in a way that we don't need to put as much chemicals onto the soil. And that's what I do, and that's what I did. I just finished my PhD in December, and now I've started doing a job as um, a research assistant in the same lab, doing the same research. But what I also have been doing all the way through my PhD is lots and lots of different outreach things. Everything from stand-up comedy to events like this where I just kind of talk to people about whatever they want to talk about. Um, but the main thing that drives me to do outreach and why I think it's important isn't because there are lots of benefits for me, because there are, there are loads. I get questions that really make me think about my research and it really makes me a much better scientist. But the main thing that drives me is my background and I really hope that there are times that when I speak to young people, because I know there are sometimes young people that have been in difficult situations when they're growing up and they're trying to do their best and they maybe don't know what avenues to go down. And I'm not going to say that I'm going to turn someone into a scientist and like have anything like that. But what I would really like to do is inspire people that if you're not sure what you want to do, if you're not sure about the routes that you want to go down, then the teachers that you work with, they're not in it for the money. They're in there to see you guys absolutely smash it and they want you to do the absolute best that you can. So if you're not sure about the route that you want to take or the decisions that you want to make in the future or how to apply to university, speak to them. Because you can and you will do awesome things, okay? And I'm just gonna close with thanking you guys all for coming. It's amazing to see how many people are here and that are interested in the journeys that we've taken in our careers. And I hope to see you guys again in the future, whether it's as scientists, as educators, or as anything you want to be. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much and good to see the video again. Thanks, Senga.
So to give you your proper introduction now, um, Senga is a postdoctoral research assistant at the University of Dundee, specializing in plant microbe interactions. During her honors, Senga developed a hands-on activity called Microbe Motels, which translates the concept of the gut microbiome and dysbiosis to children and the wider community. Senga sees outreach as integral to research and is passionate about sharing her love of science and believes that everyone should be nurtured to achieve their goals. And I think that came across very clearly in that lecture that we just saw from December 2019. So Senga, the, the questions are starting to flood in. So we'll, we'll go with those. And then we have a, a couple that we want to ask each other actually. So we'll see if we've got time for those as well. Um, the first question is from Jay Thomas. Scientific outreach can be expensive with equipment used per experiment. Do you have any advice on how to minimize the cost? Well, I think probably one of the first things um, that should be considered with any sort of development of an outreach project is to speak to the public engagement professionals at the university because it really is amazing how much resources they may have that you can use or borrow um, or adapt. Um, and they may also be able to direct you towards um, small grants and funding that, that can help you um, to get the resources that you need. For me, I whenever we, we try and develop any sort of outreach project, it, the focus really is on trying to make the um, equipment that we use to be as cost effective and as easy to attain as possible, meaning that it's more accessible for other people to maybe um, copy in a school environment or any other um, community environment relatively easily. But it's not always possible depending on what you want to do. Um, but certainly that, that, that's a good approach to take and, and definitely um, utilize your public engagement professionals because they're absolutely incredible and integral to any research outreach. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we're being asked already, what outreach are you planning next? Oh, well, um, we've always got things in the pipeline. Um, last year, we made a really cool animated video um, describing the interactions um, that happen around the, the rhizosphere, so this interface between roots and soil and the, the microbes um, that are living there. And actually, um, we're in the process of developing um, a small project where we're going to do a, a much more in-depth video. So looking at um, things that affect these interactions um, and, and just generally just making it something a, a little bit um, more professional with more information, a little bit more engaging. And so it can be used as an, um, a resource for, for, for multiple things in the future. And um, there's also been quite a lot of things going on um, despite the current global situation and um, with creating career videos and information videos about the research that we do in order to continue um, reaching out and, and um, you know, interacting with different communities and, and different people. Um, and the, the good side of that as well is that we can also kind of keep these up our sleeve for, for future things as well. So it's a really good long-term resource, resource that, that's being developed, that's great. Thanks. Um, just to say to those sending in questions, do feel free to make the questions about outreach and knowledge transfer, knowledge exchange, and or about Senga's specialist research area. I'm sure you'll be happy to answer on, on both sides. Um, one of the, the questions that we wanted to discuss between us and that, that came through in your video a wee bit as well is how outreach can complement or improve research. And you hinted at that when you said um, that there are benefits to you as an academic mm -hmm. in that when you do outreach, people ask you questions that make you rethink aspects of your research. Perhaps you could talk a bit about um, that benefit and other benefits that you derive from, from your outreach and your knowledge exchange. Absolutely. Well, I think one of, one of the fundamental elements of outreach is being able to explain a scientific concept, well, any concept, in an accessible and, and simple way. And in order to be able to do that, you really have to understand the research that you do exceptionally well to be able to explain it simply. Um, and, and that I think that's, that's really, really key. Um, but when it comes to actually 
listing the, the benefits of outreach, there, I actually wrote it down because I, I did wonder if this question might come out. So I'll mention a few of the things that I did, did write down. So I mean, when there are institutional benefits, so we're looking at how we can demonstrate, you know, social commitments and also increase our awareness of, of public interest and public's concerns and a sort of bottom up approach to, to some of the angles that we take to, for, um, towards our research. Um, and also, kind of really helps us to enable change and com contribute to social mobility, which is something that I feel very passionate about. Um, and when it comes to even the individual um, benefits, there's things like project management and, and developing your leadership skills that improves networking as well. A lot of outreach initiatives are interdivisional and interschool, and you have interactions with people and researchers that you, you wouldn't normally have. And even at conferences, something that can be quite specialist as well. It's, it's a fantastic opportunity for that. And um, I think it really stimulates creativity as well. You know, when you're thinking about ways to deliver the science that you do, I actually really kind of helps to enhance the way that you approach it in day-to-day -day life and for me and it's something that I've said in quite a few talks now but the, the biggest thing for me is, is when you're asked but why you know but you know so but why do you look at that but why is that important and and actually you, it really helps you to, to think about exactly what you're doing because it can be quite easy to start going down a research rabbit hole when you find maybe an interesting result and you think oh that, I really want to get my teeth into that and then you kind of come back and you think actually why am I wanting to do that? Where am I actually looking to, to take my research? And is this actually just a, a carrot that's dangling that's a temptation? And is it, or is it, you know, should we put this to the side and keep our eyes on, on the main task? Um, and that's that's a really important skill that, that I've learned because I can be a little bit, you know, I can get a bit like, oh, that's that looks exciting. Let's go and spend a little while looking at that. And then, you know, you, you kind of have to pull yourself back a bit. I suppose that relates to a, a question that that uh, we do ask ourselves as researchers when we're involved in translating research quite often, and that's the so what question, which is similar to your why question. What's the so what of this research? And I, I wonder if you've got an example there where you can think where you've been asked what's the so what's what's the point of this research? Because that's that's what that's what uh, you face when you're going out uh, putting your research in front of people, isn't it? I don't know if you've well, got absolutely. an example there. Absolutely. I mean, I think a, a, probably quite quite an obvious example with the research that I do, and um, particularly looking to find, um, you know, alternatives or, or ways to improve um, crop production um, using, you know, using microbial approaches and microbial tools. And um, typically, the 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 so what for me when when that question is asked is food sustainability and and um, climate change and not depending on the environment that I'm in, I might say, do you like to eat? You know, it, it, that's why it's so important and um, the research that, that's being done and not just in my own research, the, all of the research that's done um, into food sustainability and, and looking at food networks it, it is so important um, with the way that things are changing in, in the world. It, it's something that we really must adapt to and we really, really need to address and improve. And something related to that, and it's a question that's uh, come in, is is how how can we quantify and how can you quantify the impact of your outreach, the impact of this translational work that you do? Because that that's so what that you've just outlined is really really important. How do you know if you're making a difference? You know, how do you know if you're impacting on that that big global question? Well. It's actually something that's really quite a bit of a challenge when it comes to outreach is being able to quantify the impact that's being made. So for specific events, then, you know, the, there are surveys, there are questionnaires, there are just asking people at the time when they're participating, you know, what have you learned? And, and you, you can make sort of, um, I feel like, um, you put questions in as you go to kind of measure um, how well that you're disseminating the, the information, how well it's being taken up, how the, the level of interest. But I mean, when it comes to, or on a larger scale, when it comes to community engagement, and I must say this is not something that I've been directly involved with um, recently, but um, with the, the current global situation, a lot of 
the impact that's being had um, with Dundee University is, is, is quite different um, to the outreach that, that there normally would be. So, for example, there are care packages that are being provided to, to really quite vulnerable families in, in the local area. And that impact is absolutely huge. Now, although it's not direct outreach, what that is doing is helping to cement relationships and trust with the university and with the community. Um, and it's responding to communities' needs now based on what's happening. And I think that's exceptionally important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And a question that's just come in uh, relevant to what you're saying is um, from Karen Porter, what would you recommend as the first steps to reaching out then? Um, so I, I hope that I answer this um, as co correctly, if I've understood the question correctly. So um, I might under ask, answer it in two ways. So the first is um, the first steps to getting involved in outreach. I would say if you're in an academic institution, quite often you, you will have um, outreach professionals at the university and um, they might have kind of sessions where you can drop in and find out about um, events that are going to be happening and ways in which that you might be able to get involved. And there are so many different ways you can get involved. You don't have to be in the front line. You don't have to be the community facing person. There are so many things that go on in the background of even very small um, outreach um, initiatives that there is something for everybody to do that's going to fit your own skill sets and your own comfort zones um, and will be greatly appreciated by everybody involved. Um, when it comes to reaching out to communities, um, that's, that's slightly different and it varies um, based on the kind of reach that you want to do. It depends on the demographic that you want to reach. It depends on many, many things. But there are good ways to approach possibly community councils to identify areas that might be of interest for particular areas, local councils, local MSPs, um, and really your, your own experience and knowledge of the area that, that you work in as well. And again, I keep referring back to outreach professionals, but they have lots of stats. They know lots of different regions and areas that have particular needs and interests and they can certainly put you in that direction as well. There are many, many avenues. I think something that's becoming clear, Senga, is about tailoring, you know, and uh, adapting to those you're engaging with. And somebody here is, is asking about your microbe motels, which I think is really <laughs> intriguing. And, and obviously you'd use those in certain contexts and maybe not in others. Yeah. And this person is asking, what were some lessons learned during your outreach with microbe motels? Well, and I know, I know we said we had to be cautious about this when we were, <laughs> we were chatting yesterday. Um, and one of the main things is that when, if you want to engage with maybe sort of primary school age learners, a really good leveler is something a little bit gross like poo. It's really funny, it's very silly, but there's also a key important message that's coming with it and it does go in whilst they're having fun. One thing that I didn't expect um, with microbe motels, one was for it to be quite so popular and um, it was a, an, um, a project that I developed due to an idea that my child had. Um, and it was such a, a simple, simple thing that he said to me. He said, you know, if, so if you don't have the right microbes in your tummy, does that give you diarrhea? That, that was literally how it all came about. But some things that I didn't um, consider at the time, and it's grown with me um, over time, is that one, not all learners want to be hands-on. Some that's sometimes maybe too disgusting for them. Sometimes it's too stimulating when it comes to sensory things. Um, and during a time where I was incorporating microbe motels um, along with um, outreach projects from lots of other um, divisions in, in Dundee University, it was a, a medium scale event where we had two schools visit us. And um, it was really quite apparent that there were very different learning needs from, very, from many, many different learners and many different ways that they were comfortable um, approaching learning um, and I was really really pleased that during um, the development of that um, of that event um, that we had some activities and um, for example there were some drama workshops um, and there were some quieter areas and then so that way it wasn't an overload for, for certain young people but there was enough and enough variety that everybody managed to, to really enjoy several elements of the day and and that's something that only really comes with time when I first started my probe motels I thought 
everyone's going to love it because it's funny and it's gross mm. and, and actually no that that's not the case it's nothing's ever going to be a tick box for everybody mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and those are lessons as you say that you learn along the way and and that you adapt yeah. so um uh, a question that that uh, is is high on the agenda here is um, you clearly have a passion for encouraging people to follow their star and reach their potential. And as a woman scientist, have you seen an increase in women scientists in your field? And how could that be encouraged more? Well, the first question, have I seen an increase in, in, in female scientists in my field? I think that when I've kind of moved into academia, I think I've come in during the wave where actually women in science is, is really quite, quite normal, feels quite normal to me. I've never felt treated any differently for being female. I mean, and with the exception of actually maybe some, some positive discrimination. So being invited to women in science events or um, delivering talks um, aimed at, at young women and making decisions about where they're gonna go in their careers. And I think that's absolutely fantastic. And it's testament to the amazing hard work that's been done by women you know, that have so much more experience and time in academia than I do. And I mean, I must admit there are some things that I've heard about the way things had been at times, you know, being expected to, to make the teas and, and things. That, and it really shocks me because I have never, not once experienced anything to, to that sort of extent. I mean, there is a funny um, anecdote that I, that, that I will tell you. So um, I, I recently got married um, in December. And my husband and I booked uh, just a very short holiday in February. And it was myself that booked it. It was booked under Dr. Albertine because I was really quite excited about the title and using any excuse I could to use it. Um, and, and we got to the reception of the holiday place and it was myself that spoke to the person and said, oh, we've got a booking for, for, for Albertine. And she turned around to my husband and said, oh, right, okay, Dr. Albertine. <laughs> and he was like, no, no, that, no that's her. <laughs> And it was such a small, silly thing, but it just goes to show that there is still a lot of stigma and a lot of assumption th that can be made with gender roles and titles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yes. Thank you for that. Um, we're actually, we've just got uh, two minutes left, unbelievably. So it's, the time has flown by. Um, just a, a final question then. Um, how has um, the global situation of COVID-19 impacted on your work? I mean, you've only got one minute to answer that, unfortunately. So but, just, um, <laughs> yeah, very quickly. Um, yeah. So um, the impact on my work, I've been very fortunate that the majority of my work is computational. So I've been able to continue to do my work at home. Um, although it does come back slightly to the gender question, as a parent, I have found it quite challenging to balance homeschooling and balancing my workload. So I have felt my days have been quite longer and it's made me really appreciate teaching professionals because Albertine Academy really gets one star from my children. They do not recommend it at all. Um, but no, I have been very, very fortunate to be able to continue my research and also support colleagues as well with particular analyses. So yeah, it's, it's, it's been okay um, and I've been lucky for so my, my final question, if I may, is given this focus is on the importance of scientific outreach, what would be the one take home message that you would want to leave with everyone? Oh, gosh. I, there are so many, but I really, really think that when outreach is done well, the benefits to you and everyone that you interact with are absolutely massive and it's absolutely worth at least giving it a go to see if it's something that, that you would like to do. But yeah, take home message is absolutely your research. Research, I really think it, outreach is really part of research as opposed to in addition to it because the benefits are just so much. That's brilliant. What a great note to end on. Dr. Sen Senga Robertson Alberton, thank you very much. And I'm sure if we were all in a room together, there'd be a great big round of applause now. So Senga, if you can imagine that, just take a moment to, to enjoy that applause. So many thanks to you, many thanks to the audience for joining us today. Uh, just to let you know that a survey link will be coming up at the end. So if you could complete that. 
And don't forget to join us every week for Throwback Thursday and uh, remembering that that's part of the RSE's commitment to knowledge made useful. And I hope you've enjoyed that. We certainly have. And thank you very much again to Senga. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you so much. Thanks.